Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event. I am Lynn Abramson, president of the Clean Energy Business Network. Thank you for joining today's workshop and teaming event on the U.S. Department of Energy's Geothermal Geophone Prize. As we get started, I'd like to welcome everyone to please introduce yourself in the chat, including your company or organization and where you're located. And just for some quick housekeeping purposes, I wanted to note that we are recording today's event and we will be distributing the slides and recording to all registrants. And you can feel free to enter questions for our panelists at any time in the chat and we will go over those at the end. So let's briefly go over the agenda. The Geothermal Geophone Prize aims to advance current seismic monitoring technology for high temperature geothermal use. There are multiple industries with technology to be applicable to solving this challenge, including high temperature electronics, oil and gas, and micro seismic monitoring. If you feel like you may have a piece of the puzzle, you may be eligible to compete to win $850,000 in cash prizes and vouchers. Today's two-in-one workshop and teaming event will inform you about the prize and help potential applicants get started. First, I'm going to give you a brief overview of CBN's resources as a power connector and ways we can assist you in your application. Featured guest speakers will then share more information on the challenges the prize is aiming to solve and discuss how it can advance the current state of the art in seismic monitoring technology. After our presentation and panel, we'll proceed to a networking session to help you connect with other researchers and companies that might offer complementary pieces of the puzzle. Teams of applicants may be stronger for this specific prize, which involves improvements to existing geothermal monitoring technologies, as well as potentially transferable applications from other industries. So first, let me provide a little bit of background on our organization. The Clean Energy Business Network serves as a small business voice for the clean energy economy working to support small clean tech businesses through policy engagement, market and technology information, and business development assistance. Our network spans more than 6,000 small business leaders across all 50 states and a broad spectrum of technologies and services. CEDN is delighted to serve as a power connector to provide support on the Department of Energy's Geothermal Geophone Prize. We are part of a broad network of nonprofits, national labs, incubators, universities, and other partners that comprise the American-made network. Lisa Trope from NREL will talk a little bit more about this network in a moment. Next slide, please. We offer a range of tools to support applicants for the Geophone Prize and other funding opportunities. These include our free U.S. Clean Tech Funding Database, which is a searchable repository of funding opportunities across a broad range of clean energy technologies. We are also offering one-on-one -on -one office hours and application review assistance to help you pull together a compelling package for this prize. And if you've not yet done so, we encourage you to fill out our three-question teaming form to help facilitate connections with prospective partners. And finally, please contact our team at CEBN at CEBN.org should you have any questions. My colleague Annabelle is now going to drop some of the links to these materials in the chat. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be circulating the recording and these links uh, by email to all of the registrants. Now, to share more information about the Geophone Prize, I'm delighted to introduce Lisa Trope, Project Manager for the American Made Challenges at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Lynn. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm a prize administrator, a pro program manager at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. That means that I'm here to support all teams throughout the prize timeline. So I hope you will um, connect with me accordingly during this webinar and also um, in the future as you begin to apply for this prize. Um, so we're gonna go over a quick overview, very quick overview of phase one today before we jump into the panel. Um, phase one is also known as the concept phase, and we'll just go over kind of bigger picture what this program is about and phase one. So we house the geothermal geofund prize under our American Main Challenges program. You may be wondering what is the American Main Challenges program. It is currently a program that represents more than 10 offices within the U.S. Department of Energy. 20, 250 plus organizations and also 100 million in cash prizes. 
This program supports 30 plus unique prizes um, everywhere from solar to hydrogen to water to of course geothermal and the list goes on. And the foundation of the American Made Challenges program are the prizes we facilitate like the Geofund Prize while also creating partnerships that connect entrepreneurs to the private sector and also to U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratories. And with this program, thanks to rapid timelines and goals, prizes work to really fast track product development from years to months. This really allows for rapid innovation cycles. And we do our very best at the prize administration team to get expertise, resources, and funds into the hands of investors as quickly as we possibly can. So you may be wondering, what is the Geophone Prize? So very big picture. It is a $3.65 million prize, and it consists of three phases. Phase one, the concept phase. Phase two, also known as make. And then phase three, known as build. Um, as also, as I mentioned in the previous slide with the American Mean Challenges program, this prize includes the support of 250 plus organizations also known as the American Made Network. And this network includes businesses, universities, labs, and organizations also called connectors who help identify competitors for prizes and also support teams in refining their innovations and their submission packages. So the really great thing about this is the network is growing rapidly with connectors across the country and they can support you and your team with not only technical support, but business support, financial support, and the list goes on. And something that's really uh, great to note is that connectors are rewarded for this prize for supporting teams. So it is worth your time to reach out and ask for support. And we have a network matching tool that will drop in the chat that, can, that you can directly connect with connectors. And also with this, we um, do do specific contracts with specific organizations. So these are known as our power connectors. Clean Energy Business Network, who is holding this web webinar today, is one of our great power connector on this prize. And we're really excited to be working with them. And they are here to also support you on this prize. So there's plenty of support in the prize process. Of course, this is a very quick overview. So we do ask that you read the rules in detail, which is on the HeroX site, and also you can read review the informational webinar for phase one in more detail, but we did want to give you a bigger picture overview today. So for phase one, what is the goal? For phase one, participants will demonstrate that they have identified and developed an initial concept for a high temperature downhole seismic sensor that utilizes current available components or a prototype currently under development. The goal is that um, teams will pose a path to design, prototype, and a test of proof of concept. So this is the goal for phase one if you choose to apply for this prize. Um, and with this, uh, GTO is looking for specific performance metrics everywhere from temperature survivability of your prototype to frequency range, as you can see on the left. And the columns on the right is what GTO is looking for or the Geothermal Technologies Office for an acceptable range of these specifications and also an ideal range. We do encourage teams to review this specification table in detail in the rules document on Hero X as they begin to apply for this prize. Now, again, as I mentioned, this is a quick overview, but we did want to provide this list for you so you can begin to get an idea of what the acceptable ranges are as well as the ideal ranges are for specifications for this prize. And I think there was a phases, uh, was there a phase um, slide on that PowerPoint or did that not make it into the mix, Annabelle? <laughs> it might've been skipped over right before the specification slide. I think that might be the last slide that we have. Oh, got it, okay. Then we can review that when it comes up. Um, but that is bigger picture overview of the geothermal prize and I'm um, really excited to jump into the panel today, answer any questions you all have, and hopefully uh, be able to connect afterward. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that overview, Lisa. And as Lisa mentioned, uh, our colleague Annabelle is pasting some of the links to those prize materials in the chat. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be circulating those after today's event. So um, I'm really delighted to be welcoming our expert panelists to provide further context on the latest state of the art in geothermal seismic monitoring technology and the goals of this prize. 
So in addition to Lisa Trope from NREL, whom we've already introduced, I'd like to invite our distinguished panel to join us on stage. We're pleased to be joined by Ernie Major, affiliate scientist, and Michelle Robertson, program manager, both in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Craig Hartline, who is senior geophysicist at Calpine. Tim Latimer, CEO of Fervo Energy. And Nicolas Bougeot, technical advisor for Stride. Welcome. Welcome and thank you all so much for joining us. So I'd like to start by asking you to please provide a brief overview of your company or organization's work in geothermal energy and the perspective you bring to this conversation. So uh, just going in no particular order, let's start with Craig. Okay, thank you. Yeah, first of all, I'll just mention that uh, when Ernie uh, Major asked me uh, to participate this, I, I, in this, I thought to myself, well, what can I bring that Ernie can't to, to anything concerning seismicity? But I do work at the geysers, so let me talk about that. I work at the geysers geothermal field located in Northern California, about 75 miles north of San Francisco. It's the largest producing geothermal field in the world. And Calpine Corporation's renewable energy operations at the geysers span 29,000 acres include 13 geothermal power plants, 80 miles of steam production pipelines, and 69 miles of water injection pipelines. The average wellhead temperature is 359 degrees Fahrenheit. We produce about 700 million watts of electrical power output from about 315 steam production wells. This is the equivalent of the energy requirements of San Francisco. On a yearly basis, about 75% of the dry steam mass produced to the geysers power plants is lost to the atmosphere through uh, cooling towers. So our sustainable electrical power production at the geysers relies on recharge from two large scale treated wastewater injection projects based in Lake County and Sonoma County. These supply a combined nominal flow rate of about 18.7 million gallons per day. And in addition to that, we re recover some steam, steam condensate from the power plants and creek water during peak precipitation periods. Uh, a couple final comments here that the ambient uh, temperature injection water falls freely into about 58 injection wells and is responsible for the induced seismicity at the geysers, which is the point of this discussion. Uh, this occurs primarily due to thermal contraction as the relatively cool water encounters hot rock and reactivates existing fractures. We also have modest pressure perturbations associated with a static water column at the base of the injection wells. Um, just as the perspective part of this question, um, I've been a geophysicist with 19 years of 3D active seismic imaging and research at Phillips Petroleum and ConocoPhillips, and I'm now focusing on induced seismicity analysis, 3D structural model building, uh, steam production and injection well planning, and real-time drilling analysis. And thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that overview, Craig. And now I'd like to turn to Tim. Hi, yeah, it's great to be here. I'm always very excited about these American made challenges. These are a really great way to spur innovation and y'all selected a very important topic for the geothermal world. Um, by way of background, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fervo Energy. We're a geothermal energy development company and it's using a suite of new technologies, including horizontal drilling and multi-stage well completion with zonal isolation. Uh, in order to improve production in geothermal reservoirs to expand the potential and output uh, of geothermal and ultimately uh, uh, increase the um, amount of uh, uh, geothermal that can be economically developed. Um, we founded the company in 2017. My co-founder and I were both graduate students at Stanford um, with the dream of bringing these technologies uh, to bear in the geothermal industry to improve project economics and have been grateful to be supported along the way by uh, both private sector investors and venture capitalists and also some important folks uh, even on this call. Uh, we were early in the Cyclotron Road program with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So we had the benefit of uh, being co-located with folks like Ernie Major uh, in our early days as a company and 
continue to get DOC, DOE support to this day in terms of collaboration on different new field technologies and importantly with the Utah Forge projects. We're very grateful for that and excited to be continue, continuing to work with the DOE. Um, we're in a period of scaling up our production and as a company now, we've got a broad portfolio of geothermal resources that we are developing throughout the Western United States. Uh, early last year, we announced a um, development agreement with Google to power their data center systems in Northern Nevada. It was the first ever agreement um, done with Google as part of their 24 seven carbon free initiative. And we got a big boost for the geothermal sector. And then just a couple months ago, we announced a 40 megawatt project with East Bay Community Energy, uh, the, power, the power utility that represents a lot of the communities in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, and so there's a lot more demand for geothermal right now. We're at a very exciting time in the industry and the kinds of technologies like we're talking about today are very vital to realizing the, the now new market demand and renewed interest in geothermal. So that's fantastic. Uh, by the way, personal background, I started my career as a completions engineer in the oil and gas industry. Uh, I've deployed geothermals before. I've done work in the field with them and with analysis. And like many folks coming from a background in oil and gas and becoming passionate about geothermal, you figure out that um, when it's a little bit hotter down there, you need a whole different set of tools and solutions. And so I would love for us to be able to bring to the geothermal sector the same kind of sophistication and technology application that the oil and gas industry uh, it takes for granted sometimes, um, but it really relies on us driving forward innovation like the purpose of this panel. So uh, very excited to talk about this topic today. Great, thank you so much, Tim. And I can see this is clearly a very tight knit community and in some ways the LBNL uh, alumni club. <laughs> so uh, next I'd like to turn to Nicola to round out our industry participants. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, yeah, well, I'm <clears throat> I've been working uh, 25 years on, uh, on seismic sensor design, uh, mainly in Schumberger, mainly for surface seismic, but as well with some work on the, on the board. And uh, I'm now working for uh, Stride, which is a, a young company that is uh, designing and manufacturing a nodal system for, for long seismic. Uh, so you know that the surface seismic has been moving widely from cable system to uh, autonomous node. And we have been developing and creating a new generation of node it is much smaller and lightweight and cheaper than, than the prior generation, uh, that example here. So what we have done, it's a new sensor design where we have been using the battery you need to have with such a node as a reaction mass for piezoelectric sensors. And that allows us to have a, a node that can record data for over months for 150 grams, and it is relatively uh, cheap. So we already have been working uh, on, on geothermal exploration mainly, quite a few jobs uh, in Europe where the size of the node makes it quite easy to use and cheap to use, uh, especially in the urban environment. Uh, and we actually would like now to move as well to the monitoring side uh, of the geothermy. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicola. And that is impressive to see that you node know, is about the same size as my first cell phone back in the 1990s. <laughs> so uh, amazing that we can call the earth with that. Um, second to last, I'd like to introduce Michelle to tell us a little bit about LBNL's work in this space. Certainly. Um, so Ernie will follow up with probably more detail than mine, but um, we at Berkeley Lab are funded by Department of Energy and by the Geothermal Technologies Office um, and often work directly with geothermal operators, such as Craig Hartline's team at the Geysers, um, installing monitoring systems and boreholes in and near geothermal fields for hazard mitigation, for monitoring uh, protocols to maintain public safety, but also for imaging the subsurface toward developing the velocity models and creating the 3D digital structures for modeling the geothermal reservoir behavior. And my background is in field geophysics, so I'm focusing on the seismic monitoring instrumentation. As, as you can see from the fiber size behind me, we use that as active source, but we also use passive source energy to be able to test the instrumentation. Um, and we're focusing here on the data acquisition from deep boreholes for imaging the subsurface. And from here, I'll pass it to Ernie for more detail. Great. And then last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Ernie Major. And we're also, in addition to having you introduce yourself, going to ask you to tackle our first question, which will be, can you please set the stage by explaining the purpose of seismic monitoring in geothermal ex exploration? Hello, thank you for everybody joining. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, yeah, as 
Michelle said, we've been monitoring seismicity in geothermal fields for almost 50 years now. And there's really two main objectives of doing this, you know, understand the dynamics of the reservoir, why the earthquakes happen, what are the earthquakes telling us about the fluid paths and things like that, the reservoir performance, and also uh, for looking at the hazard associated during uh, micro seismicity. Uh, and of course, to support the DOE mission. Uh, when the geothermal program first started, we were actually uh, part of the Atomic Energy Commission, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And uh, it's uh, was a much larger program, you know, if you account for inflation, you know, it was like $130 million a year. And then that was due to the Arab uh, embargo on oil into the United States in 1973. So we, there's two reasons. Can I have the next slide, please? There's the signals that's coming from these fracturing events, you know, are co very complicated signals. Why do we need high temperature? As Lynn pointed out, this is a borehole. And the closer you can get to the creation of these seismic events, the more you can understand about them. Right now, we can't get as close as we'd like to. Now, the oil and gas industry, they, they have the hydrofracture uh, issues. And they have been done doing a very good job because they don't have these high temperatures. And some, they're getting up to be maybe 200 C. It's only between 100 C and 150 C. And there is instrumentation available to provide the type of targets we're looking for, but not high temperature. And so we need the high temperatures to do it. The, and also we're looking at very low frequency all the way from um, static, almost static opening of, of the hydrofractures and fracturing to the very high frequency. On the next slide, if you just look at, we're interested in the magnitude of minus twos, threes, and in that range, there's a lot of them. Uh, you get the magnitude zeros, we can do this from shallow boreholes and surface, you know, pretty easily. Uh, but most of these other events are associated with uh, very, very small fractures. Where are the smart, very small fractures? What are the source mechanisms? Are they creating permanently the stimulated reservoir volume and so forth, SRV, you know? And there's still some controversy over how, how much micro seismicity is really associated with how much volume is being stimulated. Uh, and we must remember that the magnitudes are proportional to the cube of the frequency. In other words, the smaller the magnitude, the higher the frequency. So that's why we want to get close to them. One, because the high frequency in kilohertz doesn't travel very far. And two, they don't have much energy. Is that on the next slide, please? So what do we really need? You know, we need at least 225C. That is, you know, we when we started monitoring the geysers, you know, almost 50 years ago, but actually with for VSP, vertical seismic profiling, those wells were 240C. And we couldn't quite get down to it. The seismographic service corporations had a 200 degree C geophone. Also, in Japan, Japan is looking at very high frequencies, right? Uh, high temperatures too. Also high dynamic rates. Everything I mentioned looking from almost, you know, very slow opening hydrofractures all the way up to the kilohertz, you know. So you know, wide bandwidth and definitely three components, you know, looking at the different components to understand the, the actual, the nature of the fracturing. So obviously it implies borehole installation of transistor, transist, uh, transducers. So and we want to have people looking at a wide range of, of technologies. Uh, the optical technologies, of course, is coming on board now. It's been there for the last five or 10 years. The piezoelectric uh, and integrated electronics, piezoelectrics, and the variable capacitance piezoelectrics, I feel it's an area that might be um, uh, used more wide. They already have 260 degrees C available sensors, you know. But looking at how do you get those data from a deep borehole up to the surface, uh, inertial sensors, those are many looking at uh, satellite technology, looking at where are the satellites and things like that. 
there's several companies that are dealing with that now that have, have started out looking at uh, geophysical work, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not there for geophysical work. Most of that technology, although it's really in the defense department has gone into things like self-driving cars, essentially. That's where the big bucks are. And so things like that. We want to go beyond commercial seismic. If it's already available for sale, ah, unless you can improve upon it and be cost effective, then fine. But, and then also somebody may have, okay, a really neat electronics and high temperature electronics, but that has to be coupled with a transducer and a way to get the signals from downhole to uphole. So there's a variety of challenges here. And the geothermal industry, although it's growing, and it needs to grow. Uh, there's a nice article in Science about two weeks ago about forage and geothermal energy in general. It has to be, if geothermal energy is going to be used to a great extent, it has to really almost be EGS. Um, and the hydrothermals, in other words, natural stuff that's already there, isn't going to make enough contribution to the energy gap and create and you know, stop climate change. Uh, unless it's CGS, but those still people don't have the, the uh, resources that the oil and gas companies do. So it must be cost-effective because it's going to be as long-term as you see in uh, the uh, things that Lynn pointed out. And, uh, and it's going to be uh, not as quite as widespread as say, the fiber technologies associated with the hydro fracture monitoring now in the oil and gas industry. So it must be cost effective. So anyway, I'll turn it over to Craig. And Craig, uh, I thought Craig would be a very good uh, representative to show us, all right, here are the conditions. And this is why we're interested. And the more you can, the more, the more that you can explain to the public on what you know about these micro seismicity events, the better off you're going to be and the more they will accept the technology. So Craig, um, can you maybe take over from me and, <laughs> and tell us why you think it's important to have improved instrumentation? Yeah, thank you, thank you Ernie. Um, yeah, so, so uh, what I, thought I would do is, is talk about the existing seismic monitoring program and the induced seismicity analysis techniques that we're using now at the geyser. Is this a good time to discuss this, Ernie? And then yeah, transition sure. into that? Okay, all right. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay, can we go ahead and, and start the animations on these slides and just go ahead and progress through those while I'm talking? I have four slides here. So while, while this is going, I'll just mention that a three-dimensional structural model of the Geyser's geothermal field has been developed using paradigm geophysical school of GOCAD 3D visualization and model building software. And this is continually being modified, refined by Calpine Corporation. Problems we have, extreme surface topography of the geysers causes access limitation. It prohibits the use of 3D, uh, 2D or 3D seismic data acquisition. And even if we could acquire the data, it's difficult to process that data with the significant datum issues uh, that would be involved in the imaging. An additional thing we have going on at the geysers, the extreme subsurface conditions with high temperature and corrosive fluids significantly limit the typical oil and gas geophysical logging methods to investigate the properties of the geysers, complex metamorphic and, and fractured uh, steam reservoir. Um, yeah, so I think we're at the end of that first slide there. And if you want to go ahead and progress uh, through that one also, that's okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, we'll leave it right at that point for a minute. So consequently, the primary structural model building constraints for this complex assemblage of rocks include 940 lithology log segments and the resulting lithology surface, RJS surface geologic maps, steam entries, and really importantly, we're using refined tomographic double difference seismicity hypocenters available from the Northern California Earthquake Data Center. This is essentially real-time seismic data uh, that's available due to an excellent seismicity research collaboration with the U.S. Geological Survey, and particularly with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, 
Dr. Ernie Major has been the primary force behind the development of the 38 station three component LBNL permanent seismic monitoring network that's distributed throughout and slightly beyond the geyser steam field. So the SCUA GOCAD software was originally designed for the oil and gas industry and allows synchronized time animation of water injection interval volumes and induced seismicity hypocenters at any time step and time interval. So for clarity and detail, these synchronized animations can be spatially limited and generally in the form of variously oriented uh, seismicity uh, hypocenter slices, thin slices. A good way to think of this is similar to uh, using uh, an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging by medical experts during assessment of injuries. Uh, the seismicity patterns or alignments that are evident in static displays or that evolve during time animations of the geysers induced seismicity appear directly indicative of the fluid flow pathways. Uh, these are generally near vertical fault and fracture networks oriented to the current stress field and also fluid flow progressing until it encounters, encounters relatively linear fluid flow boundaries that we believe are hydrological or uh, geological discontinuities. So anyway, variously oriented seismicity slices contribute to the interpretation of fracture and fault surfaces, structural discontinuities and lithology contrast. And this provides an additional and significant strength constraint on the 3D structural model building process. So kind of to sum up, um, what, what we're looking at in, in this view now is, is a, just a depth slice from 7,500 to 8,500 feet sub C. And here we can see very clearly that the steam reservoir appears, reservoir appears to be subdivided by intersecting zones of faulting and fracturing, resulting in steam reservoir compartmentalization. Now go ahead and progress on to the last slide, please. And um, the comments to be made here, I've talked about the constraints on this. What, what I'd like to mention here is that the goal here is a refined understanding of fluid flow paths, fluid boundaries, reservoir heterogeneity, and reservoir compartmentalization assists with our well planning efforts, uh, targeting, uh, real-time drilling analysis, reservoir management, and very importantly, it's providing a significant potential for improved seismicity mitigation of the geysers. Um, that was kind of the, the point I was going to stop on this. Uh, if if, if uh, Ernie wishes me to go ahead and get into the why we want these technological advances, uh, would you like me to go ahead and do that quickly too, Ernie, at this time? Yeah. Um, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and step into that quickly. I think that was where Ernie was leading here, and then I will duck back out for quite some time. <laughs> um, uh, some comments to be made: the boreholes at the geysers that penetrate the top steam reservoir are high temperature. I mentioned an average wellhead temperature of 359 degrees Fahrenheit. Our highest temperature in the field is 750 degrees Fahrenheit at the Pratty 32 well, which was redrilled and deepened. Uh, for Northwest Geysers uh, Enhanced Geothermal System Demonstration Project. Uh, we have a high no noise level environment due to fluid flow. The water injection flow can reduce the temperature, but it in introduces noise. We have coupling issues for steam wells when they're not fluid filled. We have often corrosive uh, conditions with high chloride, hydrogen sulfide, and non-condensable gas percentages. This is especially prominent in the Northwest geysers. Um, uh, so what do we want to do, do going forward? Uh, borehole sensors are, are as we all, uh, most of us know in this, in this discussion already, uh, provide a better signal to noise ratio. We've tested these in some shallow boreholes at the geysers. There are some 150 foot unical boreholes, some 500 foot alterot boreholes uh, that have been tested. We currently have some new geospace uh, technology sensors uh, that are designed for borehole. We're going to put in the summer. These are also three component. Uh, some things of interest to us are uh, very interested in developments with the fiber optical sensors because they have no electronics below the water line and, and, and very good uh, uh, frequency response uh, sensitivity. Um, one comment to be made with lower drilling costs, a very good solution 
could be dedicated seismic monitoring boreholes that do not entirely reach the steam reservoir. Once we reach the steam reservoir, then we've got a lot of issues with higher temperature and with uh, the uh, um, uh, corrosive fluids and the noise. So uh, getting back to a comment made by Nicholas, uh, many low cost, low maintenance sensors would be a very good solution for us if we're going to put them closer to the surface. Uh, providing higher resolution and a lower magnitude threshold because of their uh, fine, finer grid spacing or, or array spacing. And just a, a, a final comment on that topic would be that the California Energy Commission has funded a high resolution seismic program that we've been involved with since they're back in uh, 2017, I believe. Lawrence Berkeley, Array Information Technology, JARPA Data Solutions, and Calpine have uh, collaborated to put 91 temporary seismic stations within a five by five kilometer area in the Northwest geysers. And tomographic updates of the velocity model have been completed by Dr. Roland Grito, uh, along with work by Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And the results have been very encouraging. We're seeing that areas where we know there's fluid replacement of steam by water, we're seeing in, uh, increases in uh, P wave velocities and a uh, shear wave or VS velocities are going up in some areas consistent with complement rock. And a final comment on this before turning it back over would be just an improved velocity model, uh, it, minimization of the error and the, the seismicity hypercentral position would be key for us to see these patterns even more clearly. Thanks, that was, that was quite a lot, but I, I didn't quite know how, how to, how to uh, organize that. Uh, well, well, thank you, Craig, and, and um, thank you, Ernie. And I think that both of you provided a really good context uh, for some of the current limitations in the technology. Um, and also, Ernie mentioned a little bit that uh, some of the advancements, you know, we've seen in the oil and gas industries have been pretty significant, except that just not at, at such high temperatures. And I think that's a good place to turn to Tim since uh, Fervo Energy is known for taking state-of-the-art technology from other energy sectors, including horizontal drilling approaches used in oil and gas and translating those to geothermal. So uh, Tim, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the lessons that have been learned from seismic monitoring in other technology fields that can be applied to geothermal exploration and also some of the limitations of those available technologies? Yes, uh, definitely. I think, um, as I mentioned, I started my career in oil and gas. I, I am not a geophysicist. So I don't know if I could do the justice that uh, Craig and Ernie did to this topic, but I can talk a little bit broadly about what we're seeing in, in geothermal and some of the differences. I, I think whenever, one of the key differences, you know, when I talked about using uh, geophones and micro seismic monitoring in the past, it was through unconventional uh, oil and gas assets, primarily to do monitoring and analysis and optimization of hydraulic, hydraulic fracturing treatments. I started my career in the Permian Basin in West Texas. Um, and it's very difficult to imagine the shale industry taking off uh, the way that it did had there not been precise measurements to constrain things like the fracture geometry, to understand what worked and what didn't, to understand well spacing decisions. Um, and when you look at the way reservoirs are, are developed in geothermal, it's many of the same challenges, but just with kind of a twist to it, where things have to be done a little bit differently. So, you know, in, in the terms of uh, the oil and gas industry, you know, flow distribution and having even um, uh, uh, flow throughout your well is quite important, uh, just in terms of getting a good, efficient production. But in geothermal, it's critically important because if you have overly productive zones, you can deal with thermal short circuiting issues, or if you don't have zones that are activated or accepting flow, then you're not gonna actually do efficient sweep of the reservoir. So it's important in oil and gas, but critical in geothermal that you're getting even flow distribution throughout the reservoir and accessing as much of that reservoir volume as possible. So it's a little bit different there. The well spacing decisions are also quite a bit different as well, where in, uh, you know, in an unconventional oil and gas and shale, people are really often worried about uh, interference between the wells. They don't want to place them too closely where uh, you're going to have one well impacting the other. Whereas in geothermal, we're almost always producing wells in a situation where we've got uh, injection wells and production wells. And so actually using tools 
like micro seismic monitoring to get come up with high resolution measurements to understand where you can place those wells are quite important um, in terms of understanding and getting that right efficient, um, you know, both thermal sweep and high fluid flow necessary for the geothermal sector. Um, so there's quite a bit different, a few differences uh, in how we would use this compared to oil and gas. But then as we've already talked about here, there's even differences in how they're deployed as well. And so I think when we look at uh, our company's needs, and I did talk to the geophysicists on our team before this panel uh, to figure out what their asks were. And one thing I'd like to point out, I think that the specifications developed in this prize are quite powerful for the reasons that Ernie and Craig have articulated already. But um, even before we get to 225C, there's there's still a ways to go to get to other temperature windows as well. So our company, we do work, uh, um, so far, we work exclusively in reservoirs that are in the range of 350 to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, or you know around 170 to one, uh, you know 180 to, to 200 C. And even at those temperatures, we see uh, major reliability issues that limit some of the deployability and availability of, of uh, geophones. And um, in addition to that, uh, you know there's other steps needed to not only put them in a vertical context, but go to those temperatures and um, deploy them in a horizontal context like we do in oil and gas. And the price for that, whenever you look at the technology challenges, we need to address to unlock the true price of geothermal and sort of understanding our reservoir volumes better, understanding our flow distribution better, figuring out how we optimize um, the right thermal sweep and sweep efficiency between injection and production wells and place the wells in the ideal location to do that. Uh, geophones and micro seismic monitoring are very powerful tools to learn quickly, drive optimization, and come up with much better performing projects. Um, but it can only be done if we can figure out how to upgrade the tools and address some of these technology challenges so that we can access that full set of tools. So we're very excited about this. We think it's a very, it's a necessary step to really unlock the next phase of geothermal growth. And I will, I don't know if this is the right time, I know, uh, but I'll put in a plug that um, the other thing my geophysicist asked is, is uh, any groups out there looking for technical specifications or understanding what real world deployment um, looks like, and especially as you think about doing uh, proof of concept and downfall testing, you know, we're, we're quite available to share our experiences uh, and what the actual um, conditions for deployment look like for tools like this. And, and um, really excited to see where this prize goes. Great, and I really appreciate that offer, Tim, because that is exactly, you know, we want this, I know this prize is intended to be based in and founded in what the industry's needs are. And um, that's the type of, uh, you know, collaboration that we're hoping to facilitate in the teaming portion of this event, which will follow this discussion. Uh, so I want to turn now to Nicola, uh, because I know that we've talked a little bit about how the cost effectiveness of the technology is a critical component. And Stride's focus is on bringing down the cost of seismic sensors so that you can deploy a larger density of these sensors and further illuminate the picture of seismicity. So can you talk a little bit more about this effort and how it might apply to downhole sensing? Yes, I think, yeah. So yeah, I, I will start talking about uh, surface seismic first and uh, what we can that, and then I'll try at the end to see how that could apply or not to, to borehole seismic. Uh, so our journey in Stride has been trying to, to see how we could improve the surface seismic uh, equipment. And the question is, could we get better data? And what is needed to get better data uh, at the end? And so the first thing we looked at is, could, should we have better sensors? Should we improve the specs? Uh, and then we, we looked a little bit at that, and we found out that it didn't, didn't in the case of surface like, seismic, didn't make much difference. Because there's a lot of perturbation in the seismic data that we call. Uh, Craig mentioned coupling. Uh, there is all, and the Earth is not perfect. We're trying to measure reflection or a macro seismic event from a, the distant location. But then it's propagating through the Earth. And then there's a lot of things happening uh, through the Earth before you measure it. Uh, and then that includes a lot of perturbation in your data. And we found out that having a better sensors actually didn't make much of a difference. Was what was making a difference is to have more sensors, to have more data, because then, then you can try to better understand this perturbation uh, that are happening to the seismic wave along, along its way. And then you can better eliminate uh, these events recording from different uh, azimuths, different direction. And actually that's what's going to help you to, at the end to get better data. So I think for our conclusion for 
uh, surface seismic is that to improve seismic data, uh, the, the solution was not to improve the sensor. It was to have more sensors. And then the sensor then should be cheaper and easier to deploy. And that was really uh, the, the route we took. And actually, at, to the point where we said that some of the specific level of sensors were not actually that important. And we could relax some of them to make it cheaper and to make it smaller. And that's really what uh, we have been doing is trying, and that's why we ended up with such a small uh, sensors to be able to have more of them. And that was the route to getting better seismic data. So that is for the surface seismic uh, story. So how much is applicable to downhole? Uh, as, as Ellie said, some of the events you're trying to measure, the very small magnitude events uh, that's happening uh, close to the ball, you need to be down there to measure them. They are very high frequency, you need a very high resolution sensors, and there's not much choice. You need a sensor there uh, that is good enough to, to measure it. On the other end, you could discuss does this sensor as well need to record the low frequency, large magnitude events? Those one, as uh, Craig and Elisbo said as well, it could be recorded either in shallow hole if I know that high, then not at hot, or even at the surface for some of them. Uh, so I would say that, yes, you need better sensors for the borehole. You need to go down to temperature. You need to measure the high resolution, high frequency event. If you want that, there's no choice. You need better sensors for that. But for a part of the monitoring uh, that is more the higher uh, magnitude uh, events, there might be a combination, a complementary of different type of sensors in different location. And for those sensors, then probably the cost and the ease of deployment are the most important parameters. Uh, maybe in combination with some very high-end sensors that you need to go really close to the to the events. So I, I, that's what I would conclude that for people that are a bit scared by some of the of the spec, okay, some of them for some sensors will be needed, but they might I, I believe there might be room for sensors that are not really following all those specs that could be still be useful as part of the solution uh, for for monitoring. Yes, that's a really helpful clarification, Nicola. And it, it does sound like uh, it, you know incremental progress towards the overall overall gu um, guidelines and surprise would be helpful. And uh, so I want to turn to Michelle, uh, since I know that you played a very active role in crafting the specifications for this prize. So this is a good segue. Um, so can you talk a little bit, having heard from our various panelists? about the current state of geothermal downhole seismic monitoring. Um, can you just elaborate on some of your takeaways and the goals that this prize seeks to address? Yes, no problem. Um, so just as, as sort of to summarize what people have been saying, over the last few decades, and as you've heard, industry has developed excellent sensors for surface monitoring. Um, these are wide bandwidth, uh, high sensitivity, low noise floor. They're relatively easy to deploy. Um, they're reasonable cost and they can perform for years and years without maintenance. And there are also instruments that within that same performance range that can be deployed in shallow boreholes, say up to 100 meters with similar excellent performance. Um, but these systems are often limited to shallow depths and to much cooler temperatures than you would see in a geothermal field. Um, as far as the, the high temperature Borehole sensors that exist now? Yes, of course they exist. We've got geophones out there that are, you know, from uh, probably in the 1900s technologies, if you want to call it that, that perform well enough. Yes, they do um, at 200C, but they're not wide bandwidth. They're not high sensitivity. The noise floor isn't as good as the performance we need to be able to receive those very small events that we need to be able to record at depth to, to um, develop, say, high velocity excuse me, um, high resolution velocity models or the things that we need to actually be able to image suppression networks down below. So just as a, to summarize what we're trying to get to is that even though the sensors do exist, um, industry has been working on the high temperature borehole sensors. They've been working hard at it, trying to, to solve some of the problems. Um, but the, the challenges we have are that we do need to operate at temperatures at 225 or 250C for six months or more um, at depths of oh, one to two, possibly three or four kilometers, depending on the geothermal field. We need the wide bandwidth, high sensitivity, low noise floor to be able to receive those very small events. We need to push that data all the way up to the surface. 
And those sensors, once they're deployed, we need to make sure that they're not needing regular maintenance, as in you don't need to yank them out every two weeks to replace the sensors to throw them back in again. They need to have minimal loss of performance over that time period. And it's a challenge because things decay at, at high temperatures. Um, so it's it's we're looking for instruments that that parts exist um, that are development to where it is right now is is some of the parameters are met. Um, but we're looking for something that would maybe encompass maybe three or four of those parameters so that we can still get the very wide bandwidth of the no low noise floor so we can hear those tiny events at depth. That's really helpful. And I think that definitely helps to uh, frame the brainstorming for potential applicants um, with those parameters in mind. So um, I want to turn back to Lisa with respect to the prize itself. And I know when we speak to entrepreneurs and researchers that are considering applying for federal funding, these applicants often have to balance the level of effort in the application process against the potential benefit. So can you talk a little bit more about why entrepreneurs um, and researchers should invest the effort to apply for this prize and also talk a little bit about whether or not you're expecting a large volume of application. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm sure as many of you know, um, government funding has not always been or felt very accessible to a lot of folks. And with the American Main Challenges program, we're really working to change that. We want to see you be successful and with this prize model, as I discussed earlier, we are giving away cash prizes with no strings attached, meaning that you can use that money at your own accord, as well as connecting you with distinguished partners, as well as labs to be able to work on your prototypes. So with the American Made Challenges program, we really, really want you to be successful and we want to support you along the way. As I mentioned, um, we not only give away the cash prizes, but also you have an opportunity to connect with folks on the call today who are clearly experts in this field and very passionate about it as well as CEBN as well as connectors across the country and also it's not a huge lift to apply so we're really hoping there are there is a technical narrative you'll have to answer a few questions around what you believe um, your solution is to this problem to be able to create more effective and long-term seismic sensors um, you'll be asked to uh, submit a video a cover page but it is not a huge lift for being able to receive cash prizes with no strings attached, as well as support from our partners and national labs. So our whole point in American Made Challenges is to really make this accessible for you and also to really support you throughout the process so you can be successful. Um, we can't know how many teams will apply for this prize. However, we're seeing that this is a very niche field. We don't expect a huge applicant pool. And if you feel that you have a possible viable solution, we highly encourage you to apply for this. Um, so again, we're just here to support you along the way. Uh, this mission is not a huge lift like it often can be with other government programs. Um, and yeah, we're here to, to help you be successful. So really hope if you're joining today and you're on the fence that you will apply. Great. I really appreciate that, Lisa. And just to reiterate the offer of assistance, you know, we at the CEBN are very happy to work with prospective applicants to take a look at your materials, give you some feedback. We are probably not going to be the right people, unlike the experts on this call who are um, to give you super detailed technical feedback on, you know, the technical merits. Um, that's something that I think the reviewers will be more focused on, but having supported a broad range of applicants in these American main challenges, we have a good sense of what, you know, makes a successful application. It could help guide you on that process or just simple things such as how do I pull together a video? You know, we have some good tips on that. Um, I'm going to turn to a couple of uh, questions that we've received from our audience in the chat since we are getting close to the top of the panel discussion portion of our event. Um, and then if there's time remaining, I'll have a final closing question for our panelists. So one of the questions we've received from our audience is, um, what is the definition of bandwidth being used when stating the range is 0.05 hertz to 1,000 hertz? Do you want to take that one, Ernie? Uh, yeah, I guess I could get myself up and mute here. Uh, <laughs> when you say definite, what I mean, there are instruments already 
that go from 0.05 up to a kilohertz, you know, silicon audio, for example, but it's not high temperature. And it's not used in generally deep. We've used it up to a thousand feet deep and performed quite nicely in the bandwidth and range that we want. Uh, is, is that what you mean? I mean, we, again, as Michelle says, we're kind of looking for the total package at high temperature and three component and cost effective. <laughs> Other than that, this is going to be easy. <laughs> okay. And I think uh, it looks like we're getting some further follow on questions from Mike Wiley. And I'm going to suggest actually in our teaming session, perhaps in the first one, we can make sure that um, Ernie and Mike are put together in that first group to further explore any detailed questions on this front. Um, as, and that, another question I'd like to pose to Michelle, and I think we've touched on this a little bit already, um, but just to you know, kind of thread the needle on this, uh, are the specifications derived from actual customer requirements or are they transferred from lower temperature equivalent technology? I'd say it's a combination of both. Um, the, the geothermal operators need the, the results from the instrumentation, from the monitoring instrumentation. Actually, Craig, you can also um, reply to this one after I'm done. Is, is the sensors need to be sensitive enough to be able to detect the lower magnitude events necessary to be able to image the subsurface. So we, we get those collections from them, but we also know that we, what we can do with our lower temp temperature instrumentation, what those do, can do at the surface. Um, we're limited by uh, noise at the surface. We're limited by the, the cost of deployment of those surface instruments in deep in a borehole. And all, the <clears throat> instruments themselves are also limited by temperature. So it, it is a combination of, of uh, operator needs, but also what the lower temperature instruments can do. And if we can possibly move with the performance of the lower temperature to the higher temperature, it's going to solve a lot of problems for the operators themselves. Do you want to add to that, Craig? Um, I, 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 I think, yeah, I think you did a very nice job with that. The, the only thing that uh, I, I would wish to add is that uh, we, and, I, and Lynn, I, I don't know if this is a good time to discuss this, just say yes or no. Um, uh, we at the geysers have to be concerned with with our community relations um, and, and and is now a good time to do, very briefly discuss that. Yeah, so I was going to uh, close on that note, okay. um, but since you okay. have brought it up. That's uh, OK, let's uh, close I, on it. Yeah, OK, go ahead. OK, well, um, with that in mind, um, and I guess actually there's just one other quick question that before we get to that. And then we'll we'll end on that final note. Um, does and this could be for our NREL um, NREL folks, but uh, or for the industry participants, does the tool have to be wireline and clamped, or can it be designed exclusively for behind casing? And similarly, is an installation in the concrete shoe of the well with wires fibers upwards behind the case? Hopefully you understand that question a little bit better than I do. Michelle, do you want to take that? I, I was trying to figure out who it was for. That's all right. Um, so right now for the first phase, um, it's, it's just a tool itself. Don't worry about having to come up with your own deployment system or your locking on system or anything like that. If, if, it, if it can be put inside something else that would have those capabilities, that's fine. Um, you're, you don't necessarily need to um, provide the wireline to the surface, no, but you have to be able to have the ability to have your information passed along wireline or optical, however you want to do it, um, to the surface itself. So it has to have the capability of pushing that data out, and it would be coupled with something that would be provided out, out, outside of your design, uh, because that's a standard oil and gas thing or geothermal thing. We've been doing that for decades. That part's easy. What's not easy? is the high temperature instrument itself that will be able to be sturdy, long lasting, dependable, um, cost effective as always, and, and easy to, to operate once it's there. Um, and also be able to be performing for months on end without degradation in its, in its performance. So that's, those are hard questions. And that's, that's why the, we're so excited to, to see your ideas to meet this challenge. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really goal-based, and so that's helpful uh, context. 
So uh, just to get back to the question that Craig was alluding to, and I would ask our panelists to close on this note with any quick thoughts as we do want to proceed next to the teaming portion of the event. But uh, just anyone who wishes to jump in here, can you talk a little bit about how seismic data monitoring and analysis are important from a safety and community relations point? That gets behind, gets, gets behind a lot of the why we are doing this. Um, if it's okay, uh, Craig Hartline from the Geysers, I, I think this is a good question for me to tackle here. Um, I, I, I think the important things to note that uh, Calpine, uh, uh, the, the Geysers is, is in a fairly, fairly rural place, um, but we have nearby rural communities. And what we are seeing um, with the seismic analysis that we're doing is that there are very encouraging field-wide trends concerning the water injection volumes that are going into the reservoir and the induced seismicity that we're seeing. And just one example of that is uh, back in the late 1980s, we were experiencing about 32 events that exceeded magnitude three per year. Now we're down in the range of six to 10 to 12 per year. And so that's a, that's a decline of about one magnitude three and greater event every two years, which the community is, is, is very pleased with. Um, so we think that the reasons this is happening is because of the field consolidation and the improved reservoir management. And part of that improved reservoir management is the fact that we're looking at the seismicity as it progresses through the reservoir. We can see the compartmentalization. We can see where the fluid flow is going and we can do some modifications to the water injection programs. Our main goal is to distribute the water uh, more broadly, uh, both in time and in space. And, uh, and a final comment on that would be that uh, specific wells we're looking at, we're determining suitable injection rates for every well. And that's based on a good uh, understanding of the, of the seismicity and, and, and the patterns that we see in the subsurface. Um, and I, a final comment I'll make is that uh, um, this is just one part of our public relations program that Daniel Matthews Sepras, who's our director of uh, government and community affairs is handling. So she, if, if, if the time is right uh, doing this at some point, she can provide a more uh, detailed full picture of, of our community relations program. So I think I'll stop with that. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you, Craig. Is there anyone else who'd like to jump in on that before we proceed to the teaming? I'd like, to, I'd like to add just one more thing to what Craig said, add or as an example. Look what happened in Oklahoma when basically there was a, and still is a, a much understanding of induced seismicity from the oil and gas industry. There was a terrible uprising by the population there. And so the way oil and gas companies did, says, okay, we're just going to limit, limit our injection so we don't have anything greater than a 2.5. Well, <laughs> And that was due to wastewater injection, not during the actual production of the oil and gas. But that, that's because they really don't have a complete understanding of what's going on. And if you don't have a complete understanding of what's going on, the people don't have much confidence in what you're doing out there. So you either just have to limit things until people are happy, which isn't really cost effective in the long run. And so geothermal, we don't want to go that way with geothermal. You know, you want to be able to put uh, EGS projects closer to the main population areas, you know, less transmission losses, things like that, you know, and if to make EGS viable and up to maybe a 10% of the energy's country, of the, ener the country's energy needs, then that's what we have to do, come up with a better, we've gotten a few black eyes already in, in Basel, Switzerland, you know, and in Pohang recently, uh, and that's because it really didn't have enough characterization and polar understanding of what's going on. So we need to do that. Great. Well, I really appreciate the expertise of our panelists, as well as some of the thoughtful questions we're getting from our audience. And uh, please don't go anywhere. Um, I know that this is a little bit of a longer event than uh, you know you might typically see in a more static webinar format. But for those who are able to stay. We're really excited to now invite you to join the second half of our event, which is the teaming event. 